Good morning. I call the meeting to order at 10.04 on February the 9th, 2015, the Texas Real Estate Commission, and ask everyone to rise, and TJ will lead us in the Pledges of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. You may be seated. I uh, have, we've heard from uh, Chart Westcott, so I'd seek a motion to, uh, he's ill, uh, excuse his absence. So moved. And I, um, should we go ahead and add Troy and Weston since they're not here as well and we haven't heard from them? So would you amend what you just uh, amend, moved? Yeah, amend to include Troy and, I mean, uh, Mr. Alley and Mr. Martinez. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. So it is that time of the year when we elect officers, and so I would seek uh, the nomination for a vice chairman of the, this body. Madam Chairman, uh, I would like to uh, recommend that uh, Mr. Jones be uh, vice chairman for the commission. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. Are there any other nominations? All in favor say aye. Aye. And opposed, no. Congratulations, Commissioner Jones. Thank you. And uh, now we have the opportunity to elect a secretary. And I just point out before anybody jumps and volunteers that one of the jobs is uh, to go through the video every time and uh, verify that what we have done is what we thought we did. So you need to be clear on that job. So who would, does anyone wish to enter a nomination for secretary? I shouldn't have done that, should I? <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair? Yes, sir. Okay, have a motion. Do I have a second? second? Okay, got one. Any any other nominations? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. aye. And opposed, no. Motion carries. Got it. So now, um, the budget committee, I believe it's time for committee appointments, and uh, I'm making a wild guess that Commissioner Ariaga and would you like to continue, sir? Commissioner Hensley and Commissioner um, Martinez be reappointed to the Budget Committee. Is there anyone else here who wishes to serve in that capacity? Does that work for you guys? So that's done. And uh, I believe the Enforcement Committee is generally made up of the Executive Board, so we keep uh, Commissioner, is that not correct? Okay. Uh, Commissioner Jones, Commissioner Hensley, and myself. And. Uh, the group that interviewed people for the Inspector Advisory Committee was chaired by Commissioner Jones. You want to tell us what's going on there? Well, we did have two meetings uh, last week, one on Monday and one on Friday. We are advancing a slate that uh, Ms. Lewis will present to you. Well, I think we already presented that. I wanted to take this moment to thank uh, Commissioner Thomas, uh, Mr. Cecil Brooks, and, and uh, Mr. Fred Buck. I saw him in the back of the room earlier. Uh, taking this their, their, their uh, exhaustive look at this list. We had a very nice list to choose from this time and to extend my personal thanks and a thanks from the Commission for their hard work uh, in selecting this, this group and uh, for us to present it to you for your approval. Okay. Well, before we do that, let's uh, do a couple of recognition items. We've got uh, somebody that has, I don't think he's in the room, but has served for 24, 20 years of the committee's 24 years of existence on the inspector committee. And uh, I don't know if that was uh, hazard pay or what, but that's Fred Wilcox. So let's, let's recognize Fred in absentia. Also outgoing, uh, and we'll hear from him, I guess, here in a minute, is the chairman, Brian Murphy, who served for 13 years. So, Brian, you're here. Way to go. <laughs> and then two other people going out would be Michael DeHart, who's been neither a here public member and Elizabeth Heidelberg public member for a number of uh, years. So let's recognize them for their service. 
So the new people that I uh, that we recommend that we appoint, we, well, let me just say, first, we'll still have serving Brad Phillips and Steve Reinhart, Greg Eakin, and Lee Warren. I think I got all the names right. And reappointing Barbara Evans as a public member to serve until January 31st, 2017. Matt Hart, a public member to serve until January 31st, 2017. Brian Woods, public member appointment to serve until January 31st, 2016. Doyle Williamson, an inspector member appointment to serve until January 31st, 2021. Good grief. Diane Burley Rose, an inspector member appointment to serve until January 31st, 2021. Are any of those people in the room? Okay, so is that a motion item or do I just get to do that? Well, consider it done. Okay, thanks. Uh, Joanne, are you going to talk to us about uh, the Education Standards Advisory Committee? Uh, yes, uh, let me just do largely the same thing that, that Avis has done just here on one of the committees. This has probably been the hardest working committee that I have ever, ever known of, uh, chaired by uh, Susan Jones. Um, but I want to recognize everyone who has served on the committee, um, Diane McCoy, Bob Baker, Bill Evans, Andy Hemmings. Ronnie Willis, Bill Bradshaw, Pat Strong, Rebecca Ray, Rita Klein, and Rick Albers. And uh, we do have a, an outgoing member this year who is Dave Dalzell, and I haven't seen him here, but in absentia, let's, uh, let's recognize his, his service to that group. Thank, thank your members, and I'll do that. Okay. So you're good. Um, I'm going to thank the members, and then Ava says something else she's going to do. <laughs> well, who served with you to select? Was it, did you say oh, that? I'm sorry. Yes, it was Jamie, Adrian, and I. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Appreciate your service. And your recommendation is Philip Shoey from Lubbock, Texas, be appointed as the new member on this uh, committee. And also this, the service of the people, we need to be sure we're rotating it in. So Bill Evans, Andy Hemmings, Ronnie Willis, Bill Bradshaw, Pat Strong, and Rita Klein will serve until uh, December 31st, 2015. Susan Jones, Diane McCoy, Bob Baker, Rebecca Ray, Rick Albers, and Philip Shoey until December 31st, 2016. And that is how we will see that happen. Before we move on to staff reports, there's just a couple of people in the audience that I would like to recognize. We've already recognized uh, Brad Phillips and Brian Murphy from the Inspector Committee, and we have a member of the Broker Lawyer Committee who's trying to hide out in the back, uh, S.J. Swanson. We just wanted to say hi. Thank you for being here. Thanks for your service. She wanted to come today because there were no contract changes on the co on the agenda. <coughs> and we also wanted to recognize uh, a little bit of a staff change at the Texas Association of Realtors and Andy Cates, who's been attending our meetings for the last several years. And did he leave already or is he still here? He left. Andy was here for just a moment and has uh, he's going to work for the Nurses Association. So I'm not sure actually how that works. Realtors and nurses, I guess they both take care of people. But anyway, and Abby Lee will be re representing TAR from this day forward. Thanks, Thanks, Abby. Thanks for being here. And uh, now we go to staff reports, and I believe we're going to hear from Mr. Omexon first. Test. Oh, it is working. Perfect. So, good morning and welcome to all of the commissioners and thank you so much for your continued service to the people of Texas. Uh, thank you to each member who stepped forward to serve in a leadership capacity and for those who will serve on the various committees and as liaisons to the advisory and working groups where so much of the productive work of this body gets done. Your staff is grateful for the enhanced commitment you each make to ensure the work of the commission is accomplished in a highly professional manner. Like you, we believe strongly in the mission of this agency to be a highly respected model of effectiveness and efficiency in our roles as guardians of the public trust. Uh, first, let me introduce to you uh, Steve Paropoulos, our new Director of Information and Technology Services. Steve. Um, Tom Watson retains his leadership role as the deputy director of this uh, key division. Now, Steve is no stranger 
uh, to the agency, having been the company's lead programmer for Iron Data on our conversion to the Versa database. So we welcome his leadership as we look to ramp up on the rollout of new capabilities for our license holders to receive much more automated services from the agency, including a new website this year. Uh, speaking of which, website that is, after March 1st, you may go to the appraiser board website from the link on the Trek homepage to preview what the new website will look like and some of its enhanced features. So in addition to the regular committee and staff reports today, you will hear special reports on three topics in a bit more detail. Uh, Steve will brief you on changes in the ITS division, and our SES team will give you a look inside our regulation of the residential services contracts, or home warranty industry, and the timeshare registration requirements. Um, you will also hear reports from the Education Standards Advisory Committee and the Inspector Advisory Committee, both of which had one or more meetings since your last regular commission meeting in November. Several items are up for adoption on the agenda today, proposals to clarify the requirements for designated brokers of business entities, uh, fund, the funded reserve provisions for residential service uh, companies who choose to reinsure um, the um, uh, financial um, security provisions, and inspector practical education options. One additional item up for discussion and possible proposal includes adding specific text to the consumer notice section of the inspection report form uh, regarding potential risks associated with corrugated stainless steel tubing. These discussions are fully in keeping with the commission's charge to protect the consumers of real estate services in Texas by ensuring a qualified and ethical service providers. Since the legislature is in session, we will of course monitor all bills of interest to the agency and its operations, especially the chapter 1101 cleanup bill we expect to be filed very soon. We have worked closely with the Texas Association of Realtors to ensure that the bill contains all of the elements you decided were important during your workshop last November. More on this topic later in the meeting. Uh, spring promises continued advancement of the Education Standards Advisory Committee's important work, convening of the Budget Committee to begin its annual work of ensuring our finances remain sound, and integration of the new members to the Real Estate Inspector Committee. And on a personal note, I'd like to add my profound appreciation for the extraordinary commitment of Mr. Fred Wilcox to the work of this important advisory body. While we did not always see matters in precisely the same way, we always found a way to determine a sound recommendation in a respectful manner. Fred, your keen insight and quirky sense of humor will both be missed. You've left an indelible mark on the work of this agency and we owe you a debt of gratitude. Unless you have any questions for me, the directors will now provide their regular quarterly update reports. Mr. Commissioner Ariaga? Yes, sir. Um, get to Austin, pick up the paper, and there's a whole bunch of dilemma in another state agency with contracts. And I've been keeping up with it pretty close, and apparently the board was a little bit lax, I think, and if everything pans out, what I've been reading. Would it be proper at the next meeting for us to go over contracts, how many contracts we have, uh, how long they've been there, um, how they get renewed? Would I be happy to provide that detail? Uh, let me assure you that all of the major contracts come before the commission for their approval, and uh, and we make uh, we make very few uh, direct awards, and all of those would be very small, and in the and in the service of our goal of engaging uh, historically underutilized businesses. Happy to do so. Any other questions for Mr. Oaks? Thank okay. you, sir. Uh, Ms. Deanda, customer service. 
Good morning, Lori Danda, Director of Reception and Communication Services. Please refer to the C1 report. For the month of December 2014, we received a total of 15,155 calls. We assisted 189 walk-ins and responded to 5,259 emails. Now, if you compare fiscal year 2015 to fiscal year 2014, you will notice that RCS received around 3,500 additional calls and a little over 3,400 additional emails. Compared to how it was previously, RCS has made a huge improvement on the whole time, but I'm always searching for ways to continue to, to um, re reduce it. I restructured the duties of some of the team members, which will allow them to have more time on the phone. Therefore, rather than hiring the two part-time positions that I previously had posted, I'm going to um, hire a full-time position and will be responsible for handling some of the duties that the previous team members had. So at the next commission meeting, I plan on introducing an additional team member. So does anyone have any questions? Okay, thank you. Ms. Jackson, Education and Licensing. Yes, good morning. Um, Gwen Jackson, Director of Education and Licensing Services. Um, I'd like to first take a moment to introduce to you someone that many of you already know. Uh, in December, we hired Jennifer Wheeler as the Education Manager. Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer has been in the ELS division for several years. Uh, for the last year and a half, she has been our staff liaison with the Education Standards Advisory C Committee, better known as ESAC, as well as with the Inspector Education Subcommittee and the TALCB Education Subcommittee. Jennifer has overseen the day-to-day -day processes in our education section, as well as the training of our education staff, and we're pleased to have Jennifer in her new role as Manager of Education. If you would direct your attention to our first report, this is the L1 report, which provides us fiscal year comparisons for applications received, licenses issued, and renewal activity, activity from September through December. Our most significant numbers in volume show that we've processed over 6,682 original broker and sales applications so far this fiscal year. This is an 11.5% increase over the number received from September through December of 2013. This fiscal year to date, we've processed over 17,842 broker and sales renewals. Over 82% of the broker and sales agents who were scheduled to renew during this period chose to renew their license. Total renewal activity for this period is slightly down, but only by half a percent from that of last fiscal year. If there are no questions, we can move to the L2 report. Uh, this shows our licensee and registrant status. If you compare the December 2013 and December 2014 totals, you'll see that while we have a slight decrease in total brokers from 2013, our number of sales agents has increased by 9%. This brought our total of broker and sales agents to 153,363 in December of 2014, which is a 6% increase over that of 2013. Our inspector totals are at 3,094. Our ERW registrants total 2,098. At the end of December, all licensees and registrants totaled 158,555, which is a 6% increase over that of December 2013. There no questions here. Let's move to the L3 report. This report provides us with the examination activity for one month, which is the month of December. However, if you'll move to the L3A, that report shows our fiscal year-to-date comparisons. 
In looking at that report, you'll find that the fiscal year to date first attempt pass rate for the sales agent was at 50% in December 2014 and 58% in 2013. The broker pass rate was at 48% this past December and 53% in 2013. The real estate inspector was at 50% and then in 33% in 2013 and then the professional inspector first attempt pass rate was 60 percent in December and 58 percent December of 2013. If there are no questions we move along to the next report which is our education and uh, licensing services instructor distribution and there you'll find that we have a total of 4,974 uh, total approved instructors and those are broken down by type of instructors um, for the January totals uh, I will be including the uh, inspector instructors in these counts okay if no there are no questions that completes my report you have a question yeah. maybe now's not I'm sure the Education Standards Committee is still working on that recommendation for us, and they will, in a little while we have a report, I think, coming up right away. Thank you, Thank Ms. You. Jackson. Um, is, oh, Ms. Harris, <laughs> looking like Mark Moore. <laughs> no, I'm not Mark. <laughs> Sharon Harris, Deputy Director for the Standards and Enforcement Services. Before I start our reports today, I'd like in, to introduce a new employee who will be starting um, on the 17th of this month. And this is Tony Renteria. <laughs> and he will be joining us as a staff attorney. We have three reports today, and we also will have, um, for your answering your request, a short report on our residential services companies and timeshares. First, we start with the E1 report, which is the case status report. And the case status report for December shows the typically lower numbers for this month. And it shows we closed more than we opened. The total number of cases open at the end of December was 634 cases. If you have no questions, we'll move on to the E2. This is our open case aging report. Continuing the last meeting's good news, most of our cases are less than 18 months old. The few cases in the last three columns are out of our control as they are hearing cases subject to cont contested case procedures. I want to point out that the case that is over 30 months old had a proposal for decision filed just on Friday, February 6. The 24 to 30 months, that one case, that one has been reset twice. And it is being reset again probably for May 13th or 14th. Again, that's something that we can't control. The third oldest case, 18 to 24 months is another proposal for decision. It was a hearing case. We received the proposal for decision on January 16th, but it was in the exception period and we weren't able to present it to you today, but we will at the next meeting. Yeah. Yes. This is just picky math, I guess. Should 18 to 24 have a two versus a one? Or is it cumulative for the following two and then? No, so we just we just do them discreetly. Yeah, Once it graduates to the next category, so it's it's um, it's over 18 months, but it's also over 24. So it, you know. But so is the one from over 30. Yeah, over 30 months. We're just doing it discreetly, so we don't double count. Each case only fits in one category. 
there's three cases over 18 months that's correct that's that's what you're saying and we and that's this is just a different way to look at that than looking at three two one My math throws me off. Yeah. should have been a tea sipper and we haven't had low numbers like this for so long I'm just glad okay. to see it down whatever it is yes ma'am if no other questions we do have um, the e3 which is the subject categories by complaint are there any questions on this report okay and the next page is a explanation of some of these on the left hand side it gives you further information about each of those categories okay I would just reiterate uh, this this is a valuable tool and I hear from industry often that they really like seeing this yeah so I appreciate staff working on this I actually used the um, pie chart at the National Association of Residential Property Managers um, meeting conference on Friday where I spoke and I think well uh, unfortunately they had the biggest category but they do like that those in attendance they were winning. are not part of that category <laughs> so are there any other questions for the standards and enforcement services if not um, now we'll go ahead and hear about the timeshare overview and the residential service company from our staff before you leave the um, podium I would tell you that I heard several very positive comments about your presentation to the property <laughs> managers and I just thought you ought to know that people okay. thought you did a good job and we thank appreciate you. the job you're doing thank, thank you. you I enjoy it so who's coming up to do this Beverly Beverly and these are the just these little word things in the back of this presentation right <laughs> okay Madam Chairman, Commission members, I'm Beverly Rabenberg. I'm one of the attorneys with Standards and Enforcement Services. I also wear hats as the program manager for the timeshare and the RSC programs at the Commission. What you have in front of you is a short overview that's from actually from our handbook. It kind of describes the program. Uh, the program of handling of these two programs is different at the Commission in that all communications and licensing functions are handled within SES as well as the day-to-day -day program management and the complaints. So pretty much we do it from front end to back end. Mailroom opens the mail, but after that, it's pretty much ours. We have four staff positions involved in various aspects. We also have our broker sales complaints, but there's two attorneys, a legal assistant and an administrative assistant. The uh, two attorneys, it's myself and Ame Cooper. And our legal assistant, who's also the ombudsman, we'll get to that a little later, Cindy, Cindy Mahoney. Uh, we also have those assigned districts for broker sales complaints, so we kind of are always jumping from one thing to another. The timeshare program, in order to sell or offer to sell a timeshare in Texas, the timeshare plan has to be registered with the commission. We register timeshare plans from all over the country, California, Florida, if they want to sell or offer to sell here, they have to be registered. The registration is to ensure that the timeshare plan to be sold complies with the Timeshare Act requirements. Timeshare Act, as the uh, overview states, is found in Chapter 221 of the Property Code. It's kind of not anywhere in the Occupations Code. It's over in the Property Code. Um, it's a consumer protection statute. What makes it unusual is there's a five-day unrestricted right to cancel timeshare transactions there's also required disclosures there's in some cases a lengthy disclosure statement describing what the people are buying uh, if you would go to page 35 for me we put together a few quick statistics and the not a lot of complaints in this area 40 to 60 small percentage of the total complaints standards and enforcement services handles it kind of depends on the cyclical nature of the real estate market. If there's a lot of development out there, there'll be people registering and that number goes up. As you can see, uh, we had nine registration applications in 2013. So far, for part of the year, it's 2014. So there have been some years we've had 20 and 30 applications that are reviewed by myself and I'm a Cooper. 
if people want, if there's material changes, they have to file amendment applications, and that just kind of depends on what's going on out there in the market. Shifting to the residential service company program, that's the home warranties. The overview is on page 35. If a company wants to, 33, sorry, thank you, sir. If a company wants to sell a residential service contract in Texas to cover a Texas property, the company has to be licensed by the commission and the company's contracts and rates have to be approved by the commission. The general focus of that statute is ensuring the financial stability of the company so that the company will have the money to make the repairs they promise to make in the contracts that they're selling to people. Part of that financial review, the commission examines the companies. We, it's kind of like an audit, but it's a lot broader. We look at things in addition to the company's financials, including company structure, customer service, complaint handling, advertising, contract issues, lawsuits, pretty much the whole company from top to bottom. Some of the examinations we do are done on site at the companies. We have companies from all over the country that sell contracts in Texas, so that may mean travel to California, Chicago, we don't go there in the winter, or sometimes we have a couple down in the uh, South Florida area. We also do desk reviews. After we started, after I started with the program in 2003, we were going out on every single one of them, and there only were about 15 companies. We have now have 37 companies, and some of them are smaller, and a lot of the companies didn't need the desk review, didn't need three staff traveling and all of that, so we created what we call a desk review. We pretty much review the same thing, but it's handled in-house uh, by Ame Cooper. We ask for the same documents, and those have uh, saved a lot of staff time, more efficient use of resources, but it still helps us ensure that the companies are going to have the financial stability, that they're not just here today and take the people's money and gone tomorrow. In the examination, the companies pay for staff travel and expenses, but the staff time, it's part of our job. They aren't charged for that sort of stuff. Um, and the special thing about the RSC program is we have the ombudsman. That's a dedicated position with a dedicated phone number that's in all the contracts. Um, that if someone has a problem, like particularly a contract holder, they will can call into that number. They will get to talk to Cindy Mahoney. <laughs> she can uh, listen to their problem. Sometimes people just don't understand what's in the contract. We're familiar with them and we can talk to them. If it's something that's a communication problem with the company, she has contacts at all the companies. Uh, can talk to them. Sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes they bend over backwards to try and help the customer. But it's a very valuable uh, liaison we have with the companies that's rather unique uh, and is really helpful, I think, from a consumer protection standpoint. If the people aren't happy or some people can't be satisfied, they can always file a complaint. And Cindy also handles those complaints. Uh, and looking at the statistics on page 30, I'm going to throw a page right, 35. Yes? I, I, got, Karen, I got a question on the <coughs> residential service Sure. Is it safe to say it's only it's an administrative issue mostly because I don't ever remember reviewing anything about timeshares or residential services on the commission? We have had agreed orders on. On, yeah. on, uh, there have been a few agreed orders, contracts, yeah. but but the chair is right. There, it's generally it's administrative things. Most of them follow the rules, and we don't have to discipline very much. There's a few always, but not very many. What percent of your staff time is for the I'm not. It's under fifty percent. I take I t we we take the position that you know if we need to we spend the time and the programs if everyone's getting their reports in and following the rules and doing their filings that the, the program sometimes is is kind of runs itself but it's important uh, from the consumer protection standpoint as you can see there we've been running about a hundred complaints a year those are the ones handled by Cindy we many of them are resolved. Um, with the companies, they either uh, will fix something that maybe they weren't going to, or there are times they just don't agree. They think everything should be covered, or 
those extra expenses the company should pay for and the contract clearly says that's not covered and there's some, some things you times you just can't satisfy everyone it's a very small number of licensees as you can see it's it's 33 I had the number wrong we have seen a few license applications one one real focus on that is the financial as we that that's always usually where where people don't end up getting a license because they can't meet that criteria um, and the approvals we do for the evidence of coverage and schedule of charges those are fancy names for the contracts and the rates so um, depending on the year depending on who wants to change their rates one year I looked and started counting I said there was hundred and ninety seven <laughs> separate kind of like piece of paper we had to look at with that sort of stuff so um, phone numbers to give people if they have questions um, or the ombudsman number that's 512-936-3049 that rings at uh, Cindy's desk um, they can also call the standards and enforcement services number direct 512-936-3005 myself that'll get routed to myself I'm a or Cindy and we answer questions help out the public answer questions from license applicants so any questions? Any other questions for Ms. Rebenberg? Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Now we will hear from the new IT guy, Steve Paropoulos, who is the only IT guy in the building wearing a suit today. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. There is one more. Good morning. Morning. So, um, uh, my name is Steve Sparopoulos. I uh, it's my first commission meeting. I'd like to, you know, mention that uh, Doug uh, introduced me as uh, someone that had worked with the agency in the past. Uh, worked for the vendor that sold us the uh, system of record, as we call it. Uh, I was their project manager and helped with the implementation. So I had a little bit of history with TREC, and um, uh, it's it's kind of eased the transition into the role. I think. Um, so before we get started with the reports that you're used to seeing, I wanted to present to you sort of um, my vision for the division and some of the changes that have been implemented already in the ITS division um, because I firmly believe that uh, transparency is key and I'd like to share that information with you guys. Um, we have some new members of the team. Uh, we hired Phil Green. He's our infrastructure and support manager. He's right there. And the second IT guy in a suit. And uh, so Phil comes to us from the state of Colorado with 27 years of experience, um, a network and management experience. So we welcome him to the team. And then our second uh, individual is Britta Mutchler, our application support specialist. <laughs> Britta comes to us with 10 years of experience with TALCB and TREC. Um, she will be supporting the, our internal applications. And um, look forward to, um, we will also, by the way, be uh, opening up a new uh, request uh, to fill in a position here shortly as well um, and that will be a programmer position so uh, that should be hopefully by the next commission meeting I'll be introducing that new person right so kind of an overhead or kind of an overview for the ITS department our division was I wanted to have a vision and a mission statement um, this slide, as you see it here, is uh, printed and posted for all the ITS members in their cubicles so they can sort of remember as they come into work every day, you know, why they're here and sort of what their mission is. Um, and uh, so that's something that we all came up with and uh, we strive to, uh, to achieve that, right? So I think it's important uh, while you're doing your day-to-day -day work not to lose sight of the why really you know why you're there and what you're trying to accomplish on a daily basis so our current projects uh, right now for 2015 we anticipate completion of all these projects uh, the first one is the TALCB website which we 
anticipate having completed this month and like Doug mentioned you can go ahead and take a look at that as of the 1st of March to have sort of a preview of what's to come on the Trek side. Um, the automation of late CE and late reporting is something that's going to help our ELS division not have to manually track that type of work. It's going to automate the, uh, the tracking of late CE and late reporting. And that's going to be implemented in March. Uh, we have changes to our FBI and DPS interface. That's an internal project. Uh, we have the Versa upgrade to version 2.6, so that's both the client-facing Versa, the Versa online system, and the internal system as well. And there are some new, new features in the product that will help both, um, you know, Lori's team and um, the enforcement groups as well. There's new functionality mm -hmm. that we can take advantage of in this new v version of the product. And then the online uh, portion as well has some new functionality that we'll be able to take advantage of. Of course, uh, the Trek website, the much anticipated Trek website, we, we project right now that it will be delivered this calendar year. So I have a, a goal there for December of 2015 to have that live. And uh, we have some email and infrastructure upgrades going on as well. We'll be changing our email system. And uh, of course, the ongoing PC refresh, some of the older computers getting replaced and we're leasing the new ones to be more cost effective from a cash flow perspective. So another one of the changes in the ITS division is that we have split the team in two really to give better customer service overall. So our delivery side is Tom Watson and uh, he'll be delivering projects basically. So all the new work, all the new functionality that comes, you know, comes out of the team will be, will be managed by Tom. And then Phil Green, which you just saw here, is the support manager. So he'll be looking after the issues, the application issues, or the infrastructure issues, and all the functions uh, below him there as well are indicated. Um, so we are looking, the, the point of the split again, to reiterate, is just better, better service. Let the delivery team focus on delivering new functionality without being disturbed by the existing maintenance issues that come across and then they, they, they become less efficient that way, right? So um, any questions on that? Okay. So some new tools. Um, we're replacing our problem reporting system. Um, we've got some other streamlining of processes uh, that are coming into place, all with the goal of improving service levels. And of course, when you do that, that trickles down to our licensees as well. Um, and we have some team building workshops. We had our first one last week, or two weeks ago rather, and it was very successful. And uh, we plan on uh, rolling that out um, to, the other, to the other divisions as well. So any questions on the presentation? Um, I'm gonna go into the, the next, uh, you know, the I-1 report. So we had an increase in uh, pretty much throughout the board here from the last fiscal year um, of broker applications, uh, renewals online have gone up. We'll see the graphs in the next uh, report. But uh, the sponsorship transactions, additions and removals, also we saw a notable increase as well. Um, so any questions on that? So here's the... Uh, the I-2, uh, as you can see, we have an upward trend in the utilization of online applications throughout the uh, calendar, the 13 months you see there listed. Um, the same thing for renewals. Um, and then the utilization on the online management tool, the relationship management tool, for the first time crossed over the 90% uh, point uh, in December. So. Uh, Therefore, allowing licensees to go ahead and make those changes um, is, is more efficient and relieves some of the ELS staff from doing it manually. Any questions on the, e, uh, on the I-2 report? Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you. And I have never actually seen Ms. Jackson smile quite as much as she did when you said uh, you were going to take over the handling of late renewals and she didn't have to write it with a number two pencil <laughs> on a legal pad. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Ms. Huerta. I have to 
lower this. I'm not quite as tall as Steve. <laughs> He's got a few inches on me. Um, good morning, Melissa Huerta, Director of Staff and Support Services. And before I give you my presentation today, I wanted to introduce two new staff. One is here, one is not. Um, Sandy Jones, um, many of you may know Sandy. She was our purchaser before um, at Trek, and she retired back in February of last year, but she rejoined us in December, and so we're happy to have Sandy back. She enjoyed a short nine months of retirement, but she's <laughs> she, she works part-time, so today she's not here. Our second new staff member is Glenn Trammell. And Glenn, Glenn joined the agency just a couple of weeks ago. He is our human resources generalist. He recently retired from active service uh, after spending 28 years in the United States Army. He has extensive leadership and human resources experience through his military assignments. And in his free time, he enjoys scuba and taking motorcycle trips to Texas along the Texas back roads with his wife, Nima. All right, so my reports. The first one is the S1 report, and this is the budget status report as of December 31st. And I made some comments on the com in the comments section to help explain the budget variances. And um, I just wanted to point out the expenditures and revenues through December are in line with our projections. Um, the only uh, things I wanted to point out were the rent expense. It has been paid for the year. We have a few more items under that budget line, and that's why there's 9% remaining. Um, the Versa annual maintenance um, has been paid for the year, so there's a, just a few items remaining under the maintenance and repairs line item. Um, let's see, and then you can see that the revenues for the year, we're almost, uh, for the license fees, the collections were at 66.7% remaining to be collected, which is right on target. Are there any questions on the budget? I just had a comment. Sure. At, at some point, and maybe it was when a budget committee, we talked about having an additional line that just showed the pro rata nature of where you are in the budget. Uh -huh. I mean, the far right shows a percentage, but it's real hard to take that annual budget number and put it next to the exact expenditures. Okay, so um, can you bring it down just a little bit? Okay, so under the, where the, where the balance is, you mean, on that column? Yeah, no, but this is a percentage rather right. than it being the dollar amount. I mean, I guess what I'm, and I, just, I mean, I look at numbers all the time. So yeah, it's just, so the balance line is what's remaining of that line item. Right. Uh -huh, and then. Oh, you're saying, 66% is where we should be all the way down here. Yes. Okay. At the bottom. So, yeah, so each of the line items is, is different, but as a total budget, that's where we're at right okay. now. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So our next budget, our next report, this is a new report. This is the S1A, and this is um, our new investment report. These investments are of the reserve balance in our operating account. You can see on the report that we've purchased three securities and they're gonna be maturing at various times. The purchase total was $2,066,761.20 and these investments were made in compliance with the commission's investment policy. Are there any questions on this report? And I'll be giving this report quarterly also. So you can see where we're at. Okay, my next report is the S2 report. This shows the status of the real estate recovery fund as of December 31st. The total invested market value is 902,349.83. And um, the available cash balance is 1,266,731.24. And the combined val balance of investments in cash Am I on the right one? Yes. I'm on this. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm reading my, my notes here and I think I wrote something wrong here. The, uh, <laughs> the balance um, as after the reserves um, for potential payments is $1,260,526.07. All And we will have one security that will be um, maturing on February 15th and after we look at the balances, we'll make another purchase of a security. All right, the next report. 
is the S3 report. And we've paid three claims in this fiscal year in an amount of $24,080.12. Now this is a really big, <laughs> it kind of shows up really big on here. Okay. We've all got it. We've all got it. Okay. We've all got it. We can see it right here. <laughs> and you've already read it. We're it's just the people out in the audience don't worry about it. There we go. The and then um, so you can see here the, the graph that shows the payments throughout the fiscal years and uh, we're on the, the low side right now. And then my last report is the S4 report. And this is the real estate inspection recovery fund account. And it shows that we have, haven't paid any claims since fiscal year 2012. We do have two outstanding claims pending in the amount of $20,500. The, uh, the, the total balance on the account is 618, 636, 68, and that was as of December 31st. When you add back the 20,500 that was reserved for payments within 90 days, we do have in excess of the 600,000. So uh, last month we returned $39,196.68 back to the general revenue fund. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> the uh, the FBI requirement. So the DPS is for uh, is for the driver's licenses. That's what, and they're they're going back to just the thumb. But for criminal history checks, FBI requires all five. Both hands. But so t yeah, five on both hands. <laughs> yeah, I think that was right. Anything else? All right. Thank you. No, thank you, Ms. Wirt. I am aware of no report by the executive committee, unless someone else remembers something I don't. And uh, I believe we have in the audience uh, Chairman Jones from the Education Standards Advisory Committee. If you come forward and make your report, we would appreciate it. Thank you, Susan Jones, uh, Chair of the ESAC Committee. Uh, we have met twice, or at least parts of us have. Since last I was here, we had a very busy December and January. In December, the ESAC committee held our first working group meeting, and uh, just to remind you of what that was, we, uh, we did not have a full committee meeting. We had five committee members so that we, there was no quorum because there was nothing to vote on, and we invited members of our uh, education um, providers and others from, from the higher education community to come to have an in-depth discussion about the current state of distance education for real estate, uh, for the Real Estate Commission, and you asked that question, and we are uh, definitely uh, looking at ways to improve not only the quality, but to tighten up the cheating that goes on. And that is, that's a process that's going to take some time. And so we, we discussed ways to improve the diff delivery methodologies. I think those of us on the committee learned a great deal from some of the higher education people about what their requirements are so that we can figure out how to mesh ourselves together because they've got their whole set of rules and requirements. And it was an eye opener, you know, we can't just say we want this or we don't want this. It, we've got to work together and so it's a process. Uh, and we talked about faculty qualifications as well during that, and it was just an extremely worthwhile time of discussion. And we are planning our next working group meeting on March the 31st to delve further into these education issues. We will again be, be inviting stakeholders from the higher education and distance learning groups to continue the process, and I have have chosen different members of our committee to attend that one so that we're getting perspectives from uh, different ones. Um, at our meeting in January, which was a full committee meeting, we continued our discussion on qualifying instructor requirements, adult education courses for the instructors, 
and determining passage rates for providers. Uh, staff will be presenting possible options to the committee. They're doing a little bit of research for us, as well as what other jurisdictions currently use as criteria, and we will talk about that in our April meeting. The commission tasked our committee with discussing rollover uh, continuing education credit from prior license renewal periods at our last meeting. The committee voted unanimously against recommending that proposal. The committee agreed that having to meet current requirements for education for each renewal cycle would be vital to ensure that the licensees um, were up to date on the things they needed to do. And, and so we felt like it was important for them to have to touch education uh, and not be able to skip literally it could be almost four years and and we just didn't think that was a good idea and of course the ethical and legal requirements would remain the same finally I am I'm pleased to announce that at the January meeting they elected me as chair again I think it was because I was ill and on the phone at home and whoever's not there gets voted in you know how that goes um, Diane McCoy will be the vice chair for 2015 I want to thank all of my fellow members uh, on the committee and the commission for the opportunity to serve. It, I, I feel that it's an honor. And our next committee meeting is set for April the 7th. You can put that on your calendars. We'll begin at 10 a.m. up on the fourth floor. And this concludes my report, and I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? Did she answer your question? That's okay. That's okay. okay. Thank, thank you, you, Susan, and your committee and all of the people that come and represent the different industries and your work is uh, amazing all you guys have worked so hard I can't imagine the commitment that that you've made to the industry and to the consumers of Texas thank you so much thank you thank you um, somebody that's leaving oh Brian Murphy uh, would you like to come and make the uh, <laughs> Texas real estate inspector committee report did you say this was your last official act? This will Swan be my song? last official act today. Yes. So it's been a pleasure um, serving on the inspectors committee. Uh, it's been it's been uh, actually fun. You know, I've had time to be able to uh, set aside to be able to magnify that part of my uh, service. So I've been able to um, learn quite a bit actually, and so it's. Um, I'll be able to take a lot back and actually plug it into my own personal business to be able to operate in a better manner. But um, on January 23rd, the full inspector committee um, met. We discussed just two topics. We met by teleconference. It was a education topic uh, about uh, the education experience requirements for licensing, which will be addressed on agenda item 16. And then we also met and discussed, uh, or during the meeting, we discussed corrugated stainless steel tubing. This is the third time, well, third or fourth time it's come before the committee. And so we uh, uh, discussed it as well, and we're making some recommendations for changes to the inspection report form, which will be on agenda item number 19. We are going to meet again February the 27th. and. Um, I will not be there for that particular meeting, and uh, I may show up and be on the sideline, though. There, there are some education issues that I, I still uh, I would like to, to watch over. You are always welcome. <laughs> well, thank you. You have any questions for me? Any questions for Brian? Thank you so much for your service, for your time, for your dedication to the people of Texas. It's been my pleasure. That. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go to agenda item nine, I would just uh, like to remind everybody from, from this moment forward when we're out of reporting time, if you wish to speak on any agenda item, there's a form at the back. You need to fill it out, turn it in, and uh, everyone is given three minutes to speak. We appreciate you not repeating what somebody else might have already said unless you have a different uh, twist on it. And... Uh, we will also be moving agenda item 19 to between 16 and 17 so that the same presenter from the commission can 
just stay up there and not have to go back and forth. So this doesn't change much. It's going to be very close in time there, so no concern. So now uh, agenda item nine would be any general comments from visitors on a non-agenda item. To anybody wishing to come forward to make a comment on a non-agenda item. All right. This it is uh, 1103. This uh, body will go into executive session to discuss pending litigation and or obtain legal advice from our council pursuant to Texas Government Code 551.071. We anticipate about 45 minutes for this executive session. Um, thank you very much. We'll see you later. We call the meeting back from executive session at 1210 on February the 9th, 2015, and call Ms. Lewis. General Counsel to set out agenda item 11. Good afternoon, Commission members. Carrie Lewis, General Counsel. This item is a proposal for decision, uh, consideration of possible action on the proposal for decision in the matter of Trek versus Mr. Vaughn. The uh, a proposal for decision uh, was given by an ALJ dated November 20th. Exceptions to the proposal were filed by the commission staff on December 5th, and an amended proposal for decision dated January 15, 2015 was uh, issued by the ALJ. The ALJ found several violations of TREC's laws and rules and recommended an administrative penalty be assessed in the amount of $5,500. Thank you. and. Um Commissioners and members of the audience, I'm going to turn over the gavel to Commissioner Turner, who will preside over this matter. Commissioner Turner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we'll hear first from our track staff attorney that worked on this case. Yes. Sharon Harris. Um, I was the staff attorney that worked on this case. And um, I wanted to point out that the amended proposal is set out on pages 101 through 109. Um, the original proposal for decision, which is on pages 45 to 51, we did take exceptions to those, and the exceptions are set out in 53 through page 97. Um, we do agree with the amended proposal for decision, and recommend its adoption. In addition, we ask that the Commission's final order include that if the license holder does not pay the ordered penalty within a reasonable time, his license be suspended until the penalty is paid. This is similar to other Commission orders where there was an agreement to pay a penalty in a future um, to ensure that the penalty was paid. Also, this addition avoids a license holder from having the privilege of using their license during a time period when they owe the commission money. Um, Mr. Vaughn is here today and I believe would like to address you. Anyone have any questions for Ms. Harris at this time? Mr. Vaughn, are you present? Would you come forward, please, sir? We're going to give you five minutes, Mr. Vaughn, okay? I'll give you a warning when you've got about a, about a minute left, or, all right? Uh, first of all, let me thank you very much for giving me the audience. Uh, this has been going low for a long time. And um, I've been here, I think this is my second time coming from Houston, Texas. Um, the origin of the case is not uh, what I want to discuss, but uh, it's one that I want you to look into. Because uh, the 5,000 that was uh, written to me by my client, uh, by my friend at that time, was a loan. And uh, if you look at the check, it was written directly to me, not to my office. And I've, I explained that to the judge very well. At that time, I, uh, my, wife, uh, my wife had a cancer. 
breast cancer, I was in a financial trouble. And he's a friend, he explained to me. I explained to him my difficulties and everything, and he borrowed me the money and gave me the check to my name. Now he changed his mind that he wants the money back, but he wants to use the money for real estate, but not for him, but for his wife. And I tried to get in touch, in contact with the wife, the wife didn't call me. And when they called the truck, to com when he called the truck to complain, uh, I talked to Miss Sharon, and she said that if I can return the money on time, it will be forgotten. But I couldn't re return the money on time. But eventually, I returned the whole money. And I've been trying to get in touch with Mr. Ibn Kenneth, and she has been trying too, to get in touch with her, to with him. But he's not calling back. Uh, the last time I spoke to him, he told me that uh, I've paid him his money. He doesn't have anything to do with Trek or anybody else. Now, when they sent me the first, um, the first conclusion by the judge, and they asked me to pay $500, I called Ms. Uh, Ms. Sharon that, when will I pay the money? He said uh, I should file an uh, exemption, uh, exemption. I said, I don't, have, I don't have to file exemption because I'm, I'm all right with the decision of the, of the judge. But eventually, she filed an exemption. And they called me back, uh, they sent me another, uh, another order that uh, the fine would be 5000 so why should it be 5000 In the first place, we have a fine of $500 by the judge. I don't know. I don't know the judge. I don't know. I know she has been doing this for a long time. Maybe she went to the judge, and uh, the judge said that maybe that I should be fined 5500 for the thing that I've, done, I've not done. I, didn't ask, I gave the man this money. He has his money and everything. And he couldn't, she, she couldn't even get in touch with the man. Because the man always traveled from Nigeria to this place and everything. And I tried as much as possible, wrote him a letter. She has tried too. But I talked to the guy about a week ago or two weeks ago, and he said that he doesn't have to do. He doesn't, I asked him to come to Trek or send a letter that this thing has been resolved between myself and him. And he said he doesn't have to write anything. The purpose of writing is for him to get his money, and he has got his money, and he has nothing to do with Trek no more. So that's where I'm here because I know the only thing that I agree with is that I didn't report the name of my company to Trek, Ultimate Realtor. On that one, yeah, I'm guilty on that one. On the rest, I'm not guilty because the money is not supposed to be for real estate. It's supposed to be a loan, and the check was written to me directly. And I paid him in cash with money order, with money, with... Uh, um, with uh, Western Union money and we check and he has received his money and we have never heard from him again and that's my story Thank you, I appreciate that do, do any commission members have any questions for Mr. Vaughn? Madam Chair Mr. Vaughn yes, sir. Yes, while, while you're here would you before you leave would you go upstairs and file that name yes it doesn't cost anything okay but okay. that is that's the original five hundred dollar penalty yes. is that one okay. and and i noticed when you filled out your card you still use the name yes so please go file it okay thank okay. you mr vaughn when you first started you mentioned client you changed it to friend uh about the five thousand dollar uh is he a client in your mind, maybe at one time? No, he's a friend from, I've known him for over 30 years in Nigeria. And uh, when my wife had cancer, she still have the cancer, but it's in remission with thank God. I needed the money at that time. And he said he's going to help me. Now, the contract that we wrote, is not in his name. It's in his wife's name. I never met the wife. I never saw the wife, even till now. I gave him the track, uh, track one to, for him to sign. I gave him the contract for him to take to his wife to sign. I don't even, uh, I know the name of the wife, but I have not, I've never met the wife. Thank you. We're gonna invite Ms. Harris up to, to speak again, then you'll have another opportunity as well, should you choose to do so. Unless there, are there any more questions at this time for Mr. Vaughn? Commissioners, no? Ms. Harris? 
And before you before you get started on your rebuttal, may I ask you just to as as briefly as you can explain why you filed exceptions to the original proposal for a decision and what because it sounds like potentially Mr. Vaughn doesn't understand what what justifies the change and and I'd like to have that on the record today okay. from your perspective thank you um, in our opinion the um, testimony that was presented as well as the documents had not been fully included in the original PFD um, most of that was also included Mr. Vaughn's testimony at the hearing. This all rested on a $5,000 check that was written out to Mr. Vaughn's name. At the hearing, Mr. Vaughn stated that that check was a loan. He also stated that it was to be used as earnest money for Mr. Igman. About a few days, a week, we're not sure of the exact time period after the check was written and negotiated by Mr. Vaughn in his bank account, Mr. Vaughn per himself gave the commission an offer that he drafted for Mr. Igben as for his wife, exactly what he was telling you, the real estate was going to be for his wife. The offer showed $5,000 earnest money in the offer itself. So on that date that it was then presented the money had to be available if it would have been accepted as earnest money. And Mr. Vaughn did not have that money. So this all turns on that from his testimony itself, the loan became earnest money and Shortly after that, every time he tried to, well, the first was a $1,500 check that he, Mr. Vaughn, paid back to Mr. Igben, and it was returned insufficient evidence. It was at that time that Mr. Igben filed the complaint with the commission. Mr. Igben never mentioned that it was a loan. We didn't have Mr. Igben available to state whether it was or not. So according to testimony, according to the weight of the evidence, it was a loan, but it was converted to earnest money at the time the offer was drafted, and that offer showed $5,000. After that time period, which was in September, and I, I'm sorry, I forgot what year, I think it was 2013, but after that time period, Mr. Vaughn was asked by the commission to give us documents to show that the $5,000 was returned to Mr. Igben. What he gave the commission were various copy of a Western Union, copy of deposit slips into, into Mr. Igben's account through July of the following year. So it also didn't total $5,000. He stated that there was some cash that was given to Mr. Igben, maybe Mr. Igben's friend for Mr. Igben. But the, un, under the violation, it's timely accounting for and or remitting the money. He didn't meet that. Also, the violation of the 1101.652B10, which is the commingling. The check that he gave to Mr. Vaughn initially was insufficient funds. It didn't come from a trust account. It, it was his personal, from his personal account. So that was why the judge went back 
and reviewed the exceptions that I had pointed out, and he rendered the, amend the amended. And I have to say, we've asked this particular judge for through exceptions, and he has not always changed the outcome. In this case, we believe he did the right thing, including all of those, in finding, which he did not the first time, the violation set out in the conclusion of law number six. He The conclusion of law number seven was the finding about the assumed business name, which he found in the first time. Again, Mr. Vaughn at the hearing admitted to that, plus we had many documents to show that he had not submitted that information to the commission. Um, $5,000 additional for those two findings of fact, um, for those two violations, the maximum for those two violations is $5,000. It's in a range under Rule 535.191 that sets out that a violation of 1101.652B9 or B10 is $1,000 to $5,000 each. So we believe it's appropriate, and that's why we are asking you to adopt these findings of fact and conclusions of law and the recommendation with the additional um, suspension language. Mr. Igman didn't, did not testify, that's correct? We, that, that is correct. You, did you ever speak to Mr. Igman during your investigation? No. So you've never been able to, to get a hold of him? <laughs> not, since the, um, not since his original complaint. Okay. Um, Commissioner Jones? Ms. Harris, could I, um, Mr. Vaughn drew attention that Mrs., uh, Mr. Igden's wife's name was on the contract. Yes. Can I ask you what conclusions or what importance you draw to an undated letter that was received by the commission on September the 18th to you? And at the bottom of the page, I quote, it says, but anytime I talk to his wife, she would always say, talk to my husband. It appears to be a quotation. It doesn't have quotation marks. I don't know what's going on. That makes me think this is a quote from Mr. Igden's wife. And then there's a next sentence. Then he says, uh, I called his wife. She did not know anything about our business. All he asked was, all he asked her was to give her name and social security number. Is there any significance to that in your? To this particular violation? earlier. To the point he made earlier, what I concluded was he was saying that this was really a transaction. With friends. Separate. Yes. Um, again, I... My opinion at this time, I'm not sure is really relevant to this situation today because we have a judge who listened to all of the evidence. So because of that, I am not going to, you know, um, in, in my exceptions, we gave exception with what we believe the outcome should be, A, and then we also asked for an exception based on B scenario. The judge picked the B scenario, which is that this was a loan to start and changed to earnest money at the time the offer was drafted with that same amount in there. Our, he didn't pick our first choice, which was that it was never a loan. I think the only reason I was bringing up was I seem to have, at least for a moment, not having reread this, that there was uh, an attempt to separate these two acts from two different real estate transactions, potentially two different real estate transactions. The money that was given mm -hmm. was intended for something else, and this was an entirely different transaction, yet I see that seems to not be the case. No. That it, that offer that we had, which came from Mr. Vaughn, the offer with the $5,000, I'm gonna call it the Wells Fargo offer because it was for a Wells Fargo, Fargo REO property. It wasn't dated because it was never accepted. 
but it appears through several sets of documents from when he originally first was giving Mr. Igbin several MLS numbers of possible properties that might be acceptable to Mr. Igbin, that this was drafted almost simultaneous to when the $5,000 was loaned to Mr. Vaughn. But again, um, either way, we come with the same violation. He didn't, it, it was money at some point to be earnest money, and he didn't timely account for it or remit it, and it appeared it was commingled with his own funds. Councilor. Yes, Commissioner Ariaga. Um, Councilor, uh, did I see correctly, the offer was for $90,000, but it's for sale at $84,000? Mm -hmm. Yes. Any other questions, commissioners, for Ms. Harris? Mr. Vaughn, would you like to respond? Three minutes for a response. Thank you very much. At the time of the loan, if you look at the letter that I sent, in order for the wife and for the Mr. Eden to concur what I said, I gave them, I, I wrote the numbers, the phone number to the wife, the phone number to Mr. Kenneth, and the Nigerian phone number to Mr. Kenneth. I left a message for him. Now, what happened is that the wife doesn't want to deal with the situation because sometimes the wife doesn't know what the husband is doing, the husband doesn't know what the wife is doing. Now, on the second one that I have, when, when I was there the last time and spoke to the judge, the judge asked some questions, which I did answer. And I, at that time, I have a copy of my wife's medical record. I could have, I could have uh, bring it back, but it's too big. But she, I gave her copies about around something pages. And the judge told me the violation at that time on the decision, which I have accepted on the first one. I didn't know, I asked her, did I need to write something? She said, no, I don't know why she write an exception against the first one that the judge uh, ruled, which is $500. Uh, but the number is still there. If you wants to call the number and investigate, you, you are welcome to it. All the numbers are working. The wife's number is working, the Nigerian number is working, and Mr. Indian number is working. Just to concur what I said or to disagree, but that's the way it is. And the contract is not even in his name. I never met his wife. He gave me the phone number to his wife and everything. And that's what I did. Any questions, Commissioner Ariaga? Yes, sir. Mr. Vaughn. Sir. Apparently you've known Mr. Eben for a long time. Yes. He's bought a lot of properties. No, not really. He lives in Nigeria, comes to, then he came to the United States around five, six years again. I've been here since 79. Was this his first property or probably bought others? This is the first property that he has discussed with me personally. But we started with coming to my office, having a good time and everything, asked for my wife, and I told him the, the situation that my wife is not working, the cancer and everything. He was so compassionate about it, and I said this for I now and gave him the money. Thank you. But I've given all his money back, everything. Thank you. Oh, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. No problem, Mr. Vaughn. So tell, tell me and the rest of the commissioners here, was, in, is, it, is it your testimony today? I just want to make sure I understand the facts. Was, was the money that Mr. Igben gave you ever supposed to be used, in your opinion, for earnest money? No. At any point, okay? No. Um, <clears throat> what about all the emails with him where he's saying to – to use it for earnest money that, that are well, in the well, file. What I get from this, it, if I don't have a Texas license, it will not come to this. That I know. The only reason, it thinks that I'm not going to pay him. And the fastest way to pay him is to go to the track. I told him I don't have the money right now, but I will try as much as possible to pay you back. 
and he called me that he's going to report me to track. I said, there's no reason to report me to track. In the first place, your wife said he doesn't want to deal with anything that you are doing. So the question of real estate is not and void. As a matter of fact, the wife, the, I spoke to the wife, he said, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to know what he's doing. Whatever he's doing is his own business. Even she, she even told me that at the, during the closing, she's not going to come because she doesn't want to. She didn't look at any property. She did not. I didn't say whether she's black, white, Asian, uh, but I know she's a Nigerian from her name. And that's why I, provi I provided uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Sharon with the phone number. If he wants to confirm what I'm saying, go ahead and call me, Mr. Aiden. And when I called them from, we're calling from Nigeria, I even put the number there. And if you call the number, he doesn't call back. Sometimes he will call back. Since I give him his money, he doesn't want to, want to talk about it. He talks to me and says, how are you doing? How is your wife? How is everything? But about real estate, he says, it's not coming. I told him that I'll be coming today, that please come on and come and clear me so I can get this thing out of the way. He said, it's not, it's not going to travel because of that. That I've paid him his money and that's it. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, yes, if I may. Yes, ma'am. Um, I understand from what you've said here that you've known this gentleman a long, long time. Yes. Uh, and But he hadn't bought any property from you. No. Um, there's some paperwork in our file that indicates that you met Mr. Igben in the summer of 2013. Uh, it's a letter that you wrote yes. and sent to Sharon Harris. Um, he walked up to my office and said that somebody introduced my name to him. We talked and found out that we lived in the same area. So this indicates that you had just met him in 13. I've met him before. I left Nigeria in 79. It was very small at that time. So I've, I've left Nigeria in 79. It was very small at that time. So later, somebody, he knew my brother very well. And we are on the same street. Then when he, come to my, when he came to my office, he now said that. Somebody in Tuesday said, said now, now, I know him. Then he came to my office. And we went out. We had a good time and everything. That's where this thing came up. The money. I, I appreciate that. I understand what you're saying now. I just heard five minutes ago that you said something different. So it was confusing to me. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Mr. Vaughn, commissioners? Thank you for coming today, sir. Um, at this time, does anyone have a motion regarding this proposal for decision? Chairman Thomas, may I make a motion that I move that the commission accept the findings of fact and the conclusions of law contained in the ALJ's amended proposal for decision, and the commission assesses the respondent administrative penalty of $5,500, which shall be due in full no later than the 60th day after the date of this order. Additionally, if the respondent does not timely pay their administrative penalty, the commission shall immediately suspend his real estate broker's license until such a time that the penalty is paid in full. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. At this time, I will give the gavel back to our honorable chairwoman. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Thank you for handling that. And just so everybody understood, um, Mr. Commissioner Turner is an attorney. And when we deal with these highly legal things, we think it's best if he handles that, since I'm just a real estate broker. Uh, we'll move on to agenda item 12 and ask Ms. Warman to come forward and present the items that she has before us. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, up before you next on the agenda is item 12A uh, in the matter of recovery fund number 14-016, Venetian Holdings versus Latricia Williams. Commissioner Ariaga, do you have anything? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, concern of recovery fund number 14-016, I move to recommend the authorization of payment Actual damages of $2,339,025 plus interest, uh, court costs, and reasonable attorney's fees. 
Okay, Mr. Allen, we got twenty three two thousand three hundred ninety eight dollars and twenty five cents plus interest, court costs, and reasonable attorneys' fees. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. And opposed, no. Motion carries. Madam Chair, next before the commission is recovery fund number one five dash zero zero three, Leo and Deborah Jackson versus Lewis Edward Laurent. Uh, Commissioner Justice, did you have something you wanted to say before we moved on this one? You were going to recuse yourself. Oh, <laughs> yes. I'd like to recuse myself from this particular uh, deliberation. Okay. Commissioner Hensley. Madam Chair, um, on case number 15-003, I'd like to make a recommendation to authorize settlement on best possible terms. I have a motion to have a second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Madam Chair, next before the commission is recovery fund number 15-007, Robert C. Haltom et al. versus Roy L. Manley and Charlene Manley. Mr. Justice. Madam Chairman, uh, I move that the commission authorize settlement uh, for $100,000 in the matter of 15-007. Um, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 And opposed, no. Motion carries. And Madam Chair, we are recommending pulling item number 12D. Okay, thank you. Is that the end of your song and dance? Yes, ma'am. For the, for the moment? For the moment. Mm -hmm. Ms. Lewis, Counselor. All right, uh, we are now on um, agenda item 12E. Recovery fund number 14-002, Ben Long versus Evan Jacobson. Commissioner Turner. Yes, Madam Chair, I, I move that we authorize payment of settlement <clears throat> of actual damages of $40,000 plus $1,200 in attorney's fees on recovery fund item 14-002. Motion to have a second. That's several of them. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Agenda item 12F, recovery fund 12 017, Charlotte A. Hansen and James L. Hansen versus Mario Gomez and Melissa's, Melissa Gomez et al. Mr. Jones. Madam Chairman, uh, in the matter 12 017, I, re I recommend that the commission be authorized settlement of an appeal and to pay the court ordered actual damages of fifty thousand dollars motion do i have a second second all in favor say aye aye opposed no motion carries miss lewis agenda item 12g recovery fund number 15-008 alejandra abels and brian abels versus guadalupe colindres and team lupe llc at all mr ariaga madam chair uh concerning recovery fund number 15-008 I recommend the authorized payment of actual damages of $4,350 plus interest plus court costs plus reasonable attorney fees. Thank you. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 And opposed, no. Motion carries. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm requesting that item 12H be pulled from the agenda at this time. Yes, ma'am. And agenda item 12I, recovery fund 15-010. Uh, Nakia Wallace versus Townline Properties, Guadalupe Cotalinda. Commissioner Hensley. Uh, Madam Chair, I would um, make a recommendation on uh, recovery fund number 15-010, authorized payment of actual damages of $7,541.53 plus interest, court costs, and reasonable attorney's fees. Second. second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Agenda item 13. This is discussion and possible action to adopt amendments to 535.53 uh, business entity designated broker. The proposed amendments were published in the December 12th issue of the Texas Register. The amendments clarify the requirements necessary to apply for a business entity broker license and adds language regarding what is required to meet the in good standing uh, standard that's set out in the statute. No comments were received on this proposed amendment, and we recommend 
adoption as published. Commissioner Jones. Madam Chairman, move the staff is authorized on behalf of this commission to submit for adoption amendments to 535.53 business entities designated brokers and as previously published in the Texas Registry along with any technical or non-substantive changes required for adoption. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed no. Motion carries. Agenda item 14. Discussion and possible action to adopt revocation of section 535.81 recovery fund fee. The proposed uh, repeal was published in the December 12th issue of the Texas Register. And uh, it's being repealed because it's inconsistent with the commission's interpretation of 1101.603 of the Texas Occupations Code and the amended fee schedule adopted by this commission in November. No comments were received on the repeal and we recommend adoption of the repeal as published. Madam yes, Chairman. Yeah. I move that, that staff is authorized on behalf of the commission to submit for adoption the revocation of 535.81 recovery fund fee as previously published in the Texas Register along with any technical or non-substantive changes required for adoption. Motion to have a second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no, motion carries. I do have someone wishing to speak on agenda item 15 after you've set it up. Okay. Uh, this is discussion and possible action to adopt amendments to section 539.81, the funded reserve for our residential service companies. The proposal was published in the December 12th issue of the Texas Register. Uh, and the amendments were an attempt to clarify what's acceptable as an admitted insurer when a residential insurance company can use um, to cover the liability remaining under the outstanding residential service contracts written in Texas in lieu of maintaining the funded reserve required by the statute. One comment letter was received um, and after additional research and discussion, the staff has uh, agreed with some of the comments but not all of the comments and would at this point be recommending that we uh, withdraw that proposal and repropose what's presented in your materials and I'll after this comment or I'll answer any questions you have on that. Okay. Mr. Gillum in the audience. Thank you, sir. We're going to give you three minutes. But not you don't have to count the time that it takes to walk up here. Thank you, Madam Chair. I hope I'll take much less than that. I'll keep my comments very brief. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. My name is John Gillum, and I'm an attorney with Lock Lord here in Austin, and I represent American Home Shield, um, which, um, as you probably know, is a residential service company that has a license with Trek and is the largest residential service company. Um, in Texas. And as you may recall, um, I spoke at the Commission's last meeting in November concerning the proposed amendment to Rule 539.81 concerning reinsurance through an admitted insurer in lieu of a uh, residential service company maintaining a funded reserve. American Home Shield very much appreciates the time and effort that the Commission staff have continued to put into this process. I know that Ms. Lewis and, and Mr. Slagle have spent a considerable amount of additional time on this issue and we really appreciate that and we appreciate the opportunity to express um, our continued comments today um, at the Commission's meeting. Um, American Home Shield agrees with Ms. Lewis's recommendation to um, abandon the currently proposed rule um, for the reasons that we set out um, in, in our uh, letter that I believe the Commission has a copy of. And um, as Ms. Um, Lewis mentioned, I know that the Commission doesn't agree with all those rules, but I think that we're definitely on the same page. I'm sorry, it doesn't agree with all those reasons, but I think we're definitely on the same page in terms of um, what we think should be done with the version of the proposed rules that was proposed at the November meeting. Um, as far as the new propo proposed rule language uh, that the Commission is considering today, American Home Shield still believes um, that the new rule that defines the phrase admitted insurer is neither necessary nor proper on this subject. And we still, based on our initial evaluation, think that this new language still creates a conflict with the underlying statutory language. But assuming that the Commission still wants to move forward with a rule, with a rule today, we will continue to be in contact with the Commission and Ms. Lewis and Trek staff and expect to provide written comments on that newly proposed rule in a timely manner. And we look forward to working with everyone during that process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gilliam. And you only took a um, minute and 45 seconds. And so that everybody else on the commission understands uh, this to withdraw the proposal and repropose, which is another opportunity for comment. So this is not final action at all, if we were to take that action at all, the recommended. And I believe Commissioner Turner is going to take this. You ready? 
Lewis, did you have anything? I, I don't any have anything up? else to say. You you all got the write up. If there's any specific questions or clarification that someone needs, I'll be happy to answer the questions. In that case, at this time, I'll move that that staff is authorized on behalf of this commission to withdraw the amendments to Section Five Three Nine Point Eight One Funded Reserve as previously published in the Texas Register, and to submit reproposed amendments to Section Five Three Nine Point Eight One Funded Reserve as presented in this meeting, along with any technical or non-substantive changes required for proposal to the Texas Register for publication and public comment. No motion, do I have a second? Second. second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed nay. Motion carries. Agenda item 16. I do have two people who wish to speak on this 16. Oh, we're warm, warm trading warm. people. We're trading people. Madam Chair and Commissioners, Agenda Item 16 is the discussion and possible action to adopt amendments to Rule 535.212, Education and Experience Requirements for a License. Uh, this rule applies to real estate inspectors, and these proposed amendments were published in the December 12th 2014 issue of the Texas Register. The Real Estate Inspector Committee recommended the amendments, and these amendments will revise the options through which an applicant may satisfy the fieldwork component of the substitute experience requirement. <coughs> the amendments define the term interactive experience training module, increase the methods of delivery to satisfy each training option, and reduce the required hours under one option to lower costs and promote hands-on training. The amendments also extend the deadline that eliminates one option to allow course providers more time to develop courses for the other two options. We did receive one comment on this proposal as published. The commenter suggested adding the word previously before the phrase approved interactive experience training module in subsection G1 capital B Roman numeral little three. The inspector, real estate inspector advisory committee considered this comment in its meeting on January 23rd and determined the addition of the word previously did not add anything to the proposed amendments because the amended rule only applies on a prospective basis and does not affect the approval status of existing courses. The committee recommends that the proposed amendments be adopted with, as published without change. And staff also recommends that the commission adopt the amendments as published. Okay. Uh, Donna Harbuck. I don't have any comments. Okay. Stan Harbuck. Three minutes. You're familiar. Madam Chair and Commissioners of the Texas Real Estate Commission, um, just uh, one of the commissioners last time had expressed a concern about changing these definitions for interactive experience training module last time, and I just was going to try to answer that, but I don't know if the, those commissioner, that commissioner or commissioners are here. But anyway, um, uh, they may seem, uh, audio conferencing, for instance, is one of those and that uh, allows to be a, a method of delivery for the interactive experience training module. and. Um, it, I, I, the staff has sort of uh, concluded that they'll make sure that even though those criteria for delivery seem relatively easy to satisfy, even though you might think an experience module might have to have some pictures and so forth too with it besides just audio conferencing, that they would make sure that, that, that a, a standard that's appropriate for that would be met. So just an answer to someone that had raised a question about the definition last time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harbuck. Amazing. Less than a minute. Um, Madam Chair? Yes, sir. Mr. Commissioner Arriaga. Item 16, I move that the staff is authorized on behalf of the commission to submit for adoption amendments to subsection 535.212, education and experience requirements for a license as previously published in the Texas Register, <laughs> except for any technical or non-substantive changes required for adoption. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 And opposed, no. Motion carries. As you will recall earlier, I, I told you we would move the agenda. We're going to now take agenda item 19 before the commission. I have two speakers on agenda item 19, and here is a visual aid for agenda item 19. <laughs> 
Foreman. Madam Chair and Commissioners, agenda item 19 is the discussion and possible action to propose amendments to section 535.223, the standard inspection report form. The proposed amendments to this rule are recommended by the Real Estate Inspector Advisory Committee to notify consumers regarding potential hazards with improper bonding of corrugated stainless steel tubing otherwise known as CSST, or other metal gas tubing by adding language to the consumer notice concerning hazards or deficiencies section and to adopt by reference changes to the standard inspection form, uh, property inspection report form REI 7-5, approved by the commission for use in reporting inspection, inspection results. If these changes are ultimately adopted, staff recommends mirroring the changes in the OP I form at that time. I just wanted to point out to you in your materials at page 179, there is a typo in subsection one. Uh, the typo is that the uh, adoption would need to be changed to form REI 7-5 as shown in the introductory paragraph. Okay. Thank you. So I have Lavera Vincent who wishes to speak on this item and you know, Ms. Vincent, three minutes. <laughs> Tell us who you represent. We won't count that in your time. All right. My name is Lavera Vincent. I'm with the Brennan Till Foundation for Gas Line Safety. Um, I represent the Brennan Till Foundation for Gas Line Safety. It was established only four months ago. Um, Brennan was tragically killed in a CSST lightning incident in um, August of 2012. We evolve and we learn daily. We're not experts. Some have told us that we're too passionate. Some tell us that we have too much emotion, but we have a loss, we have a passion, and we have a, a mission. Our mission is to provide education and awareness about the untold dangers of CSST. So please excuse me if you find my passion offensive or if you find that it's unnecessary, but please hear our plea due to the loss of life rather than the loss of dollars. TREC directs the um, public to a website called CSSTSafety.com. The website was created and is maintained by the National Association of State Fire Marshals. The site was not available to the public until after Brennan's death, not before to create awareness, but after to avoid fault. Our perspective is that the, co the content on this website is one-sided from the manufacturer's perspective. CSST and safety do not go together in a website title or even in a home. We've learned this in a very hard way. Our cause is to relay the message before another life is gone. Manufacturers wording like may reduce, should reduce, significantly reduces the risk of, or the likelihood of re risk is reduced is perplexing to me. But what's more perplexing to me is that this has been in discussion since at least 2007. And here we are in 2015 with fires, property damage and loss of life with no action except bonding, adding bonding and grounding. Makers of CSST have tested their product once again after unexplained fires. Have you been offered the test of CSST and lightning that was conducted in 2007? Our test results, not funded by the manufacturer, is made available to you on our website at btfgaslinesafety.org. We are a David confronting a Goliath on many levels. Deep pockets and political savvy are just a couple that I would mention today. We participated in the inspector advisory uh, meeting a couple of weeks ago. Mark Goodson, an electrical engineer, the first engineer ever on the state electrical board, the engineer at the, fire, the state fire marshal's office on the scientific, scientific work group, provided information and offered these words. That's, Bonding and grounding does not work. That's the reason Brennan Till was killed. He was in a house that was bonded and grounded per code. It doesn't work. When another tragedy strikes, we will be able to look at victims in the eye and say we've done something. We were not silent. One company can no longer distribute their yellow CSST in Texas as of November of 2014. And then in the United States, that same company, uh, February of 2015 this year. Many homeowners are unaware of the dangers, such as our case. Brennan was just visiting with friends in their new home that was bonded and grounding to standards. I'll close with words from Edmund Burke. All that is necessary for evil to triumph is that good men do nothing. Brennan was a good man. 
and I know you're good men and good women. I ask that you be a voice of action with us and help us let the public know what they're up against. Uh, I have some information that I'd like to pass out to you. That would be fine. I have another speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much. You did. You did fine. <laughs> you did fine. I quit watching. Uh, Jim Narva, I'm not counting your time to walk either. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to, to come before you today. My name's Jim Narva. I'm the Executive Director of the National Association of State Fire Marshals. Uh, NASFM or the acronym the State Fire Marshals we represent and work closely with the 50 state fire marshals uh, who are the senior fire official in each state uh, their goals are public safety and fire prevention number one um, I'd like to thank you and and the uh, uh, inspectors committee for the recommendation of placing the subject of bonding yellow CSST on your agenda and for considering the addition of it to the standard inspection report form that's used by the inspectors in the field. NASFM has led a, a yellow CSST public awareness campaign for the past several years with considerable focus, effort, and attention given to Texas, given the high incidence of lightning, as well as the number of homes here, uh, estimated homes with yellow CSST in it. We've reached out to many stakeholders in Texas, including home builders, realtors, fire marshals, fire chiefs, insurance companies, home inspectors, and state officials. Essentially, we'll reach out to anyone that we think can help us get the word out to raise awareness. We've had a great response in helping the awareness, but we're not there yet. Um, the, uh, the need for bonding of yellow CSST is there it reduces the likelihood uh, when you're dealing with lightning there is no 100 percent fix i was a firefighter for many years and understand those those uh, the realities of it uh, bonding does help we don't want to stop yet we want to continue to move forward with it we've focused our efforts on homes built between the early 1990s and the mid 2000s during that time, uh, there was no requirement in the codes, the building codes or fire codes, that dictate uh, how CSST was to be installed, that it required bonding. In 2006, that became part of uh, the building codes or the fire codes. So it's those homes in that time frame that we're really focused on. It's a legacy issue. We're, we're not addressing going forward. Um, it's estimated in uh, Texas there's about 610,000 homes with yellow CSST installed during that time frame. That's out of a total of about 6 to 8 million nationwide. So you've got a large percentage of those homes uh, in Texas. Your inclusion of the language and the standards of practice for home inspectors would be a significant and positive step for raising that awareness. As public safety professionals, the state fire marshals applaud your attention to this matter. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to speak and to bring this uh, point to, to your all attention and uh, to help us raise awareness about those risks and yeah. what we might be able to do to address it. So a home inspector touches many homes and this is just one more way that we can get information in their hands. So. Thank you very Thank you, Mr. much. Norman. Just a moment, please, sir. I'm and, sorry. Or Madam Chair, may I? May I? Um, and Miss Vincent, I would I would invite you back up here if you would like to address this too. Um, don't take this the wrong way. I really appreciate you guys being here today, and I appreciate where you're coming from. 
Um, but what is it? What is it that you're trying to tell us that we are, we that this that this agency has some ability to address this issue in a manner that's more or less sufficient than we're currently addressing it? What? Um, and I'm, I apologize for not being fully up to speed on it, but I I couldn't tell. Um, Mr. Narva, again, with all due respect, whether you're whether you're in support of this rule, whether you think it's not enough, whether you think it's too much, um, <laughs> that's, best, that's the best question I can formulate right now. But can you very, very briefly just tell me what it is you think we have the ability to do that we're either not doing or, in your opinion, should do? Yes. Thank you. Turner, I'd be glad to attempt to, an answer. What well, we're in support of the rule. Uh, I'll call it a rule to include something on the home inspection report that a home inspector leaves with the, with the buyer when they when a home is going through a transaction. Um, th what we're trying to do the, the language that has been proposed uh, is a is a very good start. What we would like to see is if it is noticed in the home that a home inspector make note of that. It's really that simple. Um, so that the homeowner, whoever's buying that home, is aware that there's yellow CSST. And then they can make an, an informed decision about what they should do with that. Do they replace it? Do they bond it? Do they, where do they go with it? So it, it is in support of a rule and having that in the home inspector's report is this sufficient in your opinion or is it insufficient that is broader than I would uh, that we had initially spoken I think that's calling upon a home inspector to understand whether it's properly bonded or not maybe they can maybe they can't but what we're after is to raise that awareness would would the would a home that did that was built during the time when the bonding was not required by the building codes would that be a lack of of bonding where it's not required in other words would that even come into this in your opinion uh the, the lack of bond the lack of bonding it was not required in the codes at that time during mm -hmm. that time frame we're not asking that that's changed. It's just if it is present, if you notice that it is present, let the homeowner know. Okay. And Mr. Narva, I'd like for um, the inspector committee chairman to, to kind of help Commissioner Turner understand what we're doing here. Okay. You have a particular question or? Well, my question was just for, I mean, and <clears throat> I'd be happy to hear from you too, but in particular was from these these two witnesses as to whether or not they they obviously have a concern over this issue and what what can our agency do potentially if we think it's the right decision to make to address that concern and what what about what we're doing today is insufficient or too much or too little or etc okay. uh, currently bonding is addressed in the standards of practice it's both in the uh, electrical section for the paneling and also in the electrical section for the branch circuit area and the home inspector currently is required it doesn't matter what the age of the home is is required to look for bonding and bonding of gas piping is one of the requirements and so uh, when it comes to building standards bonding is required to be visible if it's not visible then it is a deficiency it may exist but it's still a deficiency because it's not visible. So the inspector's already required to document the lack of bonding or visible bonding during the, uh, the inspection process. Um, you know, adding this to the recognized hazard portion is a, a good addition, but when uh, there would be a recommendation to just identify that uh, corrugated stainless steel tubing is present, that still doesn't bring awareness to the other p potential areas. It would just be added to the report as a line item. You know, is corrugated stainless steel present? Yes or no. And But it doesn't bring to light the other conditions that may uh, 
uh, go along with that. The inspectors are being trained throughout the state, not only during their education portion of pre-licensing, I've spoken with other education providers and it's all part of their curriculum and it's also they're being trained or taught to be able to identify corrugated stainless steel or CSST. And then also that uh, there, when the Lubbock uh, incident did occur, heightened awareness you know, really came about. A lot of the associations started doing specialized training, putting on, um, you know, during their regular training events, they put on two, two hour, four hour, and just recently one of them put on an eight hour event specific to corrugated stainless steel. So it, it currently is part of the standards of practice for inspectors to identify it and look for it and report on the lack of it. And there's even more education being provided at this time just because of uh, the heightened awareness the news feeds and everything else that are going that's Let's don't going on. that we have a witness up here that needs to talk on but I just one quick question to one small item would you for the record make it clear that not all CSST is yellow that was part of his testimony a number of times please tell us is it all yellow no, it's not all yellow. So corrugated stainless steel has sheathing on it, and the, you do have different right, color of yellow. sheathing. But um, you know the yellow stuff that you see on the outside is not the actual stainless steel that's being del that's delivering the gas system. Okay, let's. Can I? Yeah, I'd like to hear from yeah. Ms. Vincent, Madam Chair, with your permission. And don't go too far. Yes, like I said earlier, uh, we're we're not experts. We're uh, learning and evolving daily. As far as the language. Um, that's probably beyond my knowledge, but I can say, I guess where it says where required, and I don't understand required by whom. Um, and then I also um, mentioned earlier, we brought um, an expert in the field, Mark Goodson, an engineer, and he offered the advisory panel to, um, to help in any way that he could. And he also, the, the letters that I gave y'all, uh, Mark addressed um, the language and, and I guess the direction that the advisory panel was going in. And, um, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I feel like that was kind of ignored um, because it, it was never, and, and maybe that was my perception. And if, it, if that's the case, I apologize for that. But um, I, I just felt like that um, Mark was pretty much dismissed. Um, uh, the um, lightning test, CSST and lightning test um, were done by the manufacturer in 2007. And then also by, um, the foundation or prior to the foundation and in both cases it's my understanding that um, with bonding um, direct and indirectly um, it failed 100% uh, so um, and uh, again my understanding that the test results were the same in 2007 as they were two years ago two and a half years ago and I just want that to be considered um, I agree with Mr. Narva the more education, the more educated we can make our consumers and our homeowners, that's what we want. But I don't know, um, I'm going to have to to lean on Mark Goodson when he says that bonding and grounding doesn't work. I don't understand how it's a part of the, the verbiage. Um, maybe it helps, but, but if I'd say ask Ken and Becky Till, does it work? They're going to tell you absolutely not. We lost Brendan in a home that was less than a year old and it was bonded to standard bonded and grounded so I, I just I ask that you do your due diligence and um, help us get the word out okay Commissioner Justice uh, I, I just have a question then so is is the is the line that says with improper bonding of corrugated stainless steel tubing or other metal gas tubing is that is that what concerns you? You're, you're, you're concerned about the bonding at all, much I'm less improper. I, I'm, yes, I'm concerned about that. And then um, I was looking at, it says, uh, lack of bonding or corrugated stainless steel tubing or other metal gas tubing or piping where required, required by whom? Um, I guess, as it stands, and, and I think I also saw in language that staff has the right to uh, change the wording and Right now, if to me, it's not in a position that I know it's just under consideration, but to me, it's just it's not ready yet. Um, and again, I don't know what I'm talking about either. So yeah, let, me, let, me, let me tell you, yes, uh, just so you know, this would be proposed and published for comment and comments will come in 
the inspector committee will review those. They may come back to us at our next meeting in more than likely May. We'll be setting that at a little later time today. And uh, this will be reviewed again, perhaps posted again for comment because the comments are so overwhelming one way or another that something else changes significantly. So that's that's our process. It's established by the government. That's what we have to Madam do. Madam Chair, Thank you. Yes. I have a, just a question not to continue to labor this, but um, I, if, if I understand correctly, what you're really saying is, I mean, we're addressing an issue, but what you're saying is the issue is not really addressing um, the safety. We're, we're dressing it up a little bit, but we're not um, making it, um, I mean, really what you're saying is we're changing this language and the corrugated tubing doesn't matter. I mean, if it's grounded and bonded, it doesn't matter. According somebody can still be, somebody can still be killed. The guy that wrote this letter. Okay. Can I ask an inspector, just for my knowledge and purposes, or whichever one wants to comment. It's the fire marshal guy. That's the inspector guy. Okay. I would, I would really like, just for my knowledge, either one is fine. Whoever can answer this question is um, what what would make it safer, um, in your opinion, or your you know knowledge of the industry and the situation. What what would make it safe if bonding and um, grounding does not make it safe? What kind of language do we have to add in there? Um, I'm just curious from a structural perspective. What do they have to do? Is is there a solution? You know, I I didn't. I don't know that there is uh, a, an absolute solution. Uh, I can say that the, what governs how a building is put together, how it's built, the structure, is based upon codes, fire codes, building codes. Uh, currently, uh, the, the industry standard dealing with gas is NFPA, National Fire Protection Association 54, fuel gas code. Uh, it allows and specifies bonding. That came in in the late 2000s. It's still in the code. That's what, that is the standard that's used. So I can't tell you if there's something else short of, and I don't say this with any disrespect, stop, short of stopping lightning. I don't know that when it hits a, a home, all bets are off. I've seen that many times. So I don't know that there's any single solution to how it impacts any component in a home. So we focused on yellow CSST in this case, and, and I believe that bonding does help. Obviously, NFPA does as well, or it would come out of the building codes. And just to so be clear, so what you're advocating is an, is an additional line item on the form that's provided to homeowners that says you have yellow SST in your house. Um, is that... Uh, it's essentially, yes. It, it, the line might be there. It's just if it's marked, it would be you have it. If it, it's not marked, that they didn't notice it. Because we can't, as a body, as an aside, I mean, we can't promulgate building codes. Yeah. Um, we have absolutely no authority to decide what materials can or cannot go into the construction of a house. But we, we can control disclosure disclosure and what inspectors are required to notify people of. What, what inspectors do the seller disclosure which is one of the things that this their the inspector committee talked about is a statutory item and that would be a legislative issue although there has been some discussion i'm not sure any action has been taken to go have have the inspector committee go to the trade association and ask them to update their seller disclosure form which goes beyond the statutory minimums and have a question on there about whether or not a homeowner is aware of, of the existence of this product in their home just kind of a simple yes or no question and I don't I don't know whether I mean this has only just been a couple of days ago so I don't Mr. Doubt Murphy yeah can we do that <laughs> when when would we we did meet on January the 23rd and since then we have not met again so on February the 27th the inspector committees uh, will reconvene again and this topic I would hope would be on the agenda because there were recommendations that we would uh, come before you to make recommendations to talk to the broker lawyer committee and see if there's some some type of changes that could be made to the seller 
owner's disclosure so that the homeowners, you know, because properties can change from, you know, transaction to transaction. So are they aware of CSST being in their home? That way it can be on the seller's disclosure. I know there may be some pushback to that. So there was also conversation made to uh, get out to the associations, Texas Association of Realtors, and also to be able to go to the Houston, you know, Houston Association and go to, you know, the, um, um, that the Dallas, you know, Metro Techs, I believe, and start educating on seeing if they would add this to their seller's disclosures that that are more broadly used by real estate agents than the the TREC, you know, seller's disclosure. And one quick question, please, ma'am. Um, when when would um, bonding on corrugated stainless steel tubing not be required? I had the same question that, that Ms. Vincent did about what, is, what what's the point of the where required language. And I don't, I'm not saying there's a right or wrong answer. I'm just curious. Correct. Yeah. Before 2009, there was just a generic bonding of gas piping uh, within the codes. And so the National Electrical Code, then the uh, International Residential Code for one and two family dwellings that are regulate that regulate the building standards. And so prior to 2009, they just said bonding of the gas piping. And that bond, bonding could be what's called an indirect bonding that's made through the appliances. Once corrugated stainless steel started showing uh, uh, not some failures, the, uh, it was introduced into the code book or the International Residential Code in 2009. That means it made the National uh, 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 the Electrical Code in 2008 for an external bond. And that's basically what you see before you is having an external bond of the copper wiring onto the, the uh, galvanized piping and uh, making that a requirement. And it's even stated there is what's a, called a commentary to the code. And the authors who put this in said this is to help lower the potential but will not eliminate you know, uh, failure problems. And that's the, even the authors who wrote the code said this, this is a, it's another layer, but it is, it's not a, you know, it's not a catch-all. It's not going to keep it from happening 100%. But right now, this is the only written standard for it. So when you were asking earlier, what, what can we do? Right now, this is the only written standard for it. There's not a 100% elimination. There's not another level to go to after this. And if it helps, the inspectors are trained to look for this. And to answer your question, by what authority, the home inspectors are regulated in the state of Texas by a set standards of practice. And so in the standards of practice that are regulated by the Texas Real Estate Commission, looking for bonding is one of the requirements that they're required to do. And again, bonding is supposed to be visible. So if it's not visible, we write it up. And we, we understand that home inspectors are not code inspectors, but truly what it's all leveraged on are codes. And so it's, you know, what, what do we look at to be able to look at a property that's 50 years old versus brand new. So the, the standards of practice regulate what the inspectors are required to do regardless of age. So okay. with, with the question that I propounded to Mr. Narva earlier, would lack of bonding, or excuse me, would, would bonding not be required on, on houses that were built prior to that being added to the code and then therefore would those houses fall outside of this as it's promulgated right here it was required uh -huh. just in a different form and so when again this entered the code in 2009 as an addition, but before then it was required as well, just in a different form. This is uh, the consumer notice is basically putting the consumer on notice in the, way, in the way it's written that the inspector is required to report these items and put you on notice. And then that way you're aware of these components regardless of age. Thank you. Madam Chair, just one last comment. Um, I would say, to reference to your, it's a code inspection. It's more of a code inspection. Um, I would say from a consumer perspective, they see it as a safety inspection. Correct. 
and and so my my hope is that we address it in both levels on the seller's disclosure you're only as good as the seller discloses it right. and on the other side in the inspection you're really only as good as that inspector explains it because at you know at this date in time there's so many things that it can be a deficiency and an inspector from a from just a knowledge of whether it's really a concern or not as they go over that form it really soft shoes that so you know I appreciate the fact that y'all are continuing to educate the inspectors because really they are the ones that are speaking to our consumers about safety Correct. and they're the ones that are going to be tasked with it Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Madam Chair, I'm, uh, just for a point of clarification right quick, I, I appreciate everybody sitting here and letting us discuss this. Um, and it, in, in case it may cause me to need to recuse myself later, I did not know Brennan, um, but I grew up with Ross and Meg Rushing, whose house blew up where Brennan died. Um, I did not put two and two together until this morning that this is what we were talking about. Um, and Ross is a home builder, too. So um, if there's, there, there are things our agency can do and things it can't do. Um, but if, there, if this is a concern and there are things that we can do to better inform the consumer of something that is a danger, um, if it's determined that it's potentially a danger, then I think we ought to do it. And so um, I will reiterate, you folks stay involved because all we're doing right now in the administrative process is putting this out there for this kind of public comment. So come and talk to us, bring your folks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you all, all for doing that. So, um, okay, Madam turn. Chair, uh, agenda item 19, uh, recommend um, motion move that staff is authorized on behalf of this commission to submit the proposed amendments to 535.223 standard inspection report form and the form adopted by reference as presented along with any technical non-substantive changes required for proposal to the Texas Register for publication and public comment. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Motion carries. So again reiterating Commissioner Turner's comments please please get your people to make comments please pay attention please help us make a good public policy decision agenda item 17 on page 141 in your materials carrie lewis again uh, this is discussion and possible action to propose amendments to section 543.4 forms and these are um, updates to the updates and clarifications on the forms used to register, amend, and renew a timeshare plan. These have not been updated in a long time, and these forms are adopted by reference in this rule. Commissioner Justice. Madam Chairman, I move that staff is authorized on behalf of this commission to submit the proposed amendments to 543.4 forms and the forms adopted by reference as presented along with any technical or non-substantive changes required for proposal to the Texas Register for publication and public comment. A motion, do I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Again, anyone interested in that, please make comments. Agenda item 18. Discussion and possible action to propose amendments to section 535.401 required notice. The uh, proposed amendments to this section update and clarify the form easement and right-of-way agents are required to give consumers prior to the consumer entering into a transaction concerning easement and right-of-way. I will note in the rule there's a typo. Um, the form number is listed as 4-0. It should be 4-1. And um, again, this is a notice that was brought to our attention by a question from a consumer to a legislative office. And this form hadn't been looked at or updated in many, many, many years. And so we're bringing you this proposed update. John, sir. Oh, Commissioner Arriaga. Sorry. On behalf of this, I move that the staff is authorized on behalf of the commission to submit the proposed amendments to subsection 535.401 required notices and the form adopted by reference as presented along with any technical or non-substantive changes required for the proposal to the Texas Register for publication and public comment. Do I have a motion? Do I have a second? All in favor say aye. 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 And opposed, no. Motion carries. Agenda item 20.
20. Discussion and possible action to propose amendments to section 535.2, broker responsibility. The proposed amendments insert the obligation to notify the com commission when a broker delegates responsibility to another license holder for more than six months. This provision was inadvertently dropped from another section during the reorganization and clarification of chapter 535. Okay. Jones. Madam Chair, I move that the staff is authorized on behalf of this commission to submit this proposed amendments to 535.2 broker responsibility as presented along with any technical or non-substantive changes required for a proposal to the Texas Registry for publication and public, and public comment. Second. A motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Motion carries. So please make comments on agenda <coughs> items 17 through 20 as they are made available for that possibility. Agenda item 20, I believe I have Mr. Olmexon and perhaps Mr. Slagle on the front porch. <laughs> <laughs> on the front porch? Yeah. Wow. Uh, commissioners, as I, as I reported in my uh, general um, earlier report to you, uh, we continue to work, work closely with the Texas Association of Realtors uh, to ensure that the, that the uh, draft bill um, contains all of the items that, uh, that you designated as important uh, after your workshop in November. Um, I just wanted to report to you that that continues. Um, I don't know, uh, um, as of this moment, I do not have a projected uh, date at which that bill will be filed. I know that during the uh, winter meeting, uh, there have been several discussions on specific provisions of that proposed bill. And so I do expect as those meetings wrap up uh, today and tomorrow um, that decisions will be made um, uh, with respect to that. I'm happy to answer any questions generally on that bill. Uh, the process, it has been positive uh, and, and engaging uh, so far, but there's a few key provisions that, uh, that require input from some of the various uh, um, policy recommending committees at TAR. Um, I also uh, asked uh, Tony Slagle, our government affairs coordinator, to, uh, uh, to, to give you a brief report on a few, just a few, of the bills that we're looking at that have been filed already. Um, so just a few of those that would have uh, a major impact uh, on the agency if, uh, uh, if adopted as filed. Okay, so you always have to look worst case. That's exactly what it says. Don't know if that's what would actually be in the law, but uh, that's why we follow them uh, and take our opportunities during the session to uh, comment um, uh, on them if they make it to a hearing uh, before a committee. So if there are no questions for me, I'll ask Tony to come up and give you a brief uh, a commentary on a, just a few bills. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, as Mr. Olmexon said, I'm going to just briefly touch on a couple of things. Um, we're, we're looking at a broader section of bills that I'm going to talk about, but obviously we're at this stage where there's not a whole lot of action going on. Um, as he mentioned, I'm going to touch on things that have a major impact, but oddly enough, the first bill I'm going to speak of uh, is one we're just monitoring because the caption's broad enough to where it could, along the process, incorporate us. It doesn't currently incorporate us now, but it's uh, regarding uh, the requirements for a meeting of um, county commissioner courts, uh, elected school districts, uh, entities like that, that they, that's requiring them to broadcast their meetings online and to archive them. We currently, while there's no requirement that we do that, we do that already. So if we are to get incorporated into this, it wouldn't be an issue with us. It's already something the commission does um, in practice and by policy. Um, another bill I'd like to speak on is uh, HB 486, followed by Donna Howard. This bill would require um, the Texas Ethics Commission to post the annual financial statements of uh, individuals, uh, state officials, including those appointed by the governor on their website. Currently, they um, house them in-house and they're required to keep them for two years. 
um, after the date that that person is no longer on the, the commission or board or appointed. Um, this would require them to post them online. There are some restrictions on the type of information they can post. They have to redact addresses and things like that. But And then uh, along with destroying the records after two years, they would remove them from the website after two years as well. So obviously of interest to, uh, to all of you up there. Uh, the third one is uh, HB 551 by Eric Johnson. This bill uh, has some provisions in it that if passed as filed would limit the agency's discretion in, ter in determining what crimes are directly related to the duties of our license holders um, uh, for which the agency may deny, revoke, or suspend a license. So we're keeping an eye on that. Both It would Im impact both the commission and the board and both the enforcement uh, divisions are aware of the bill and we're monitoring that to make sure we, we know where that's going uh, as, it, as it moves forward. Uh, let's see, there was, I believe, one additional bill I wanted to touch on, and that is HB 631 by Representative Bonin, which uh, would, uh, it provides that a person who would commit a class three felony for representing that a website is an official web page of a state agency um, without the agency's consent and with the intent to obtain uh, benefit or cause harm. Currently, um, while we have some uh, authority over that, it's a class three misdemeanor, so this would obviously bump, bump that up to class three felony. So there are um, some other bills we're monitoring. Uh, a, a portion of them, a good portion of them, are in fact like that first one I mentioned, which while they don't have an impact on the agency, the caption of the bill is broad enough to where we want to just make sure that nothing sneaks in that we are unaware of and then it passes and we're scratching our heads about it. So. Any questions about anything? Any questions for Mr. Slagle? Good job. Thank you. Appreciate you. Agenda item 22, discussion of possible action for our investment policy. Ms. Huerta. Melissa Huerta, Director of Staff and Support Services. All right. Last year we had three investment policies. Um, they were all identical except for the titles. We had one for the real estate uh, a state uh, recovery trust account, one for the real estate inspection fund, and one for the reserve funds. So what we have now is just one policy with all uh, for all the funds, and uh, there's no substantive changes from the pol on the policy from last year. Um, as the policy states, the investments are laddered so that they mature at different times throughout the year. The funds are held and invested with the Texas Treasury Safekeeping Trust as authorized investments of state funds per the government code section 404 and this policy is the same as the one that was approved last year at the uh, February Commission meeting but the section uh, 2256.005 E of the government code requires that the investment policy be reviewed and approved annually by our governing board thank you mm -hmm. Is there any yes. questions? Commissioner Hensley is going to make a motion and we'll see if we I'll have any questions. I'll make a motion on uh, agenda item 22. I uh, recommend that and so move that the commission approve the TREC investment policy as presented. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Now do you have any questions? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. And opposed no. Motion carries. Agenda item 23. Ah, Ms. Jackson. Spending the day with us. The whole day. Quinn Jackson, director of uh, ELS division. Agenda item number 23 is the discussion and possible action to approve new TREC forms or to change current forms. There are five forms before you. The first is the supplemental form for military spouse, SFMS-1. That form is updated to clarify residency of an armed forces member prior to the issuance of a license. The next form is the affidavit regarding substitute experience field work requirement, INSA-1. That form is being updated to include revisions proposed at the November commission meeting regarding section 535.218. Uh, the notice of assumed business name or DBA for a professional real estate inspector or real estate inspector's license form number IDBA-0, and that form is being updated to add, um, that form is a new form 
to notify the commission of assumed business names for real estate inspectors or professional real estate inspectors. The fourth form is the real estate inspector license application, number REIA-6, and that form is being updated to add a place to list assumed business names, if any. The final form is the professional real estate inspector license, or REPIA-6, and that form is updated to add a place to list assumed business names, if any. Staff recommends approval of the forms as presented. Are you wanting to do that? Oh, TJ wants to do it. Commissioner Turner? Yes, ma'am. We have just one correction on uh, item 23B, uh, the amendments regarding form INSA-1 are being proposed to include revisions adopted by the commission at this meeting okay. regarding rule 535-212. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair, I move that the commission approve <clears throat> new or changes to TREC form supplemental form for military spouse SFMS-1, affidavit regarding substitute experience, field work requirement, INSA-1, notice of assumed business name or DBA for professional real estate inspector or real estate inspector's license, IDBA-0, real estate inspector license application, REIA-6, and professional real estate inspector license, REPIA-6, as presented, along with any technical or non-substantive changes. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Agenda item 24. Do we have any future agenda items? We just did 23. Future agenda items. Nope. Future meetings. There was also a supplemental document on the table about that. I believe our next meeting, unless we has been already posted as the 4th of May. May. May 4th is good. May 4th is good. That would make us run into what, August? August uh, 17th uh, would be the next default uh, date. Works for me. Monday, August the 17th. It's not, of course, won't be finalized until our, our May meeting. But you might also look at, uh, at Monday, November the 16th. Those are the third Mondays are the defaults. I say the 17th is a Monday. Yeah. August. August. August the 17th, November the 16th. November, I'm sorry. I thought he said August. November the 16th. Okay. That falls under any arguments. Diego. Yeah, we're in San Diego, but we're in the 26th. November. November. Right. So you may want to accelerate uh, November to the 9th? I don't know. <laughs> Is everybody okay with, good with the August date before we move over to? Yes. Okay, so we were going to propose August the 17th, which we will set in May on the 4th, and we are going to discuss just a little bit. You guys have the NAR on the 16th? I have NAR that goes all the way back to the 9th. I got it from the 11th to the 16th. Okay. 13th to 16th. Or 11th, 16th, yeah. So you like 9th? 11th. You like the 9th, right? What was it in August? 17th. 17th. The blue dots on the 27th, right? That's just to let you know that there are some other, that's LBJ's birthday. Oh. We wanted to be sure you could celebrate that at your, whenever you wanted to. <laughs> Is it in, in Texas? And I, I don't know for how much longer, but certainly for the last um, couple of decades, that's been a, a skeleton crew day. Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. I would like to make a, make a comment or really just say a thank you. I didn't take the opportunity to do that in the last meeting. I'm, I'm now completing my sixth year, uh, which is hard to believe. It's been six years. The only reason I know it's been six years is 
I didn't come the first year with these. And as you see, I haven't put them on and off very briefly. So it's, um, it's been a true honor to serve. Um, really, really has. I've certainly enjoyed uh, the opportunity to participate in um, protecting the consumer and continuing to raise the level of professionalism in our business today. Um, I've, I've enjoyed and, and loved being able to, when we started, we accomplished a lot. And I think one of my first tasks was hiring this guy <laughs> on a search committee. And we've moved spaces and we've become independent. And there's just a tremendous amount of advancement I think that we've had and I'm I'm really really honored to play a very very small part and be at this table with all these great people we so thank you and want to say thank you to the staff as well because it's certainly um, a hard hard job and I I appreciate all that you've done so hope to see you again I'm in, on the budget committee and and treasurer so <laughs> but you never know at the pleasure of the governor so but thank you. Well, Madam Chairman, since uh, Jamie has made it so easy for me, we too came in at the same time, and I can't say anything other than ditto to what she has said. Uh, when I first uh, got this appointment, I thought, oh my gosh, how did I get here and why? But it's amazing to work with the group of people that you get to work with, uh, to see the number of people who, meeting after meeting, come from other parts of uh, the industry and affiliated industries and care enough to spend their time sitting here waiting for someone to acknowledge them for three minutes, Madam Chairman. <laughs> uh, and uh, it is, it's, it's a great, uh, great feeling to be involved in that. So thank you. you want to, I'm sure. Oh, sure. I think I said my piece last time. Uh, so I was early. I, I echo everything. It's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed getting to know each and every one of you, I think, as um, as a public member looking in on this from the outside, um, and as somebody who's been ex has some experience working in state government and working with different agencies, um, I think this agency is run tremendously well. Um, the staff, um, Mr. Old Mixon, you guys do a great job, and you commissioners do do a great job too. And it's it's really it's really been a pleasure to walk over here every few months and sit down with you guys and um, I've enjoyed it well I thank all of you you bring each of you bring something unique to the table that helps us make better decisions uh, we'll see what the governor our new governor does and perhaps we'll know that by May we may not know that by May I've known years when he didn't when the other governors didn't make a decision until a year later so we'll see how long you get to sit in this chair or maybe you get to sit in this chair for another six years uh, glad to work with all three of you glad to have the opportunity to get to know you it ditto what you said about the staff and unless there's some other thing that i've failed to pay attention to i think we're about done and the meeting is adjourned at 145.